Let's read together. Luke 21, beginning in, verses, in verse 1, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small coins. And he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the conviction, the challenge, and the comfort of your word. Lord, our understanding is that as a church, our responsibility is to be faithfully teaching the word week by week, to verse by verse, line upon line, go through it so that we begin to understand the God who has written it for us. And so we pray that in this passage this morning that you will open this to us, be our teacher as always the one upon whom we depend to bring us the true meaning of this and then to apply it to our life. And then, Father, help us to be those who are obedient, joyfully, enthusiastically, eagerly obedient to do the Word of God. We thank you for, Lord, the wonderful privilege we had last week to witness those who were following you in baptism. Always a great time. For some reason, this seemed even greater than usual, and we are thankful for the way that you have moved in the lives of people. Thank you for every volunteer. We thank you for every ministry you give us to be part of, whether it's here or abroad. For every missionary, Lord, as we try and keep those names and those people in front of ourselves and pray for them and give to them, both as a church and individually, that your word might be made known far and wide because we believe that there is where the power is. The Word of God ministered by the Holy Spirit of God. And so we look to you now to do exactly that this morning. We have done due diligence, Father, to prepare as best we know how. But now we pray that you will light the fire of your Word in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you have not already, please turn with us to Luke 21. Trust, as always, that you're bringing your Bible each week as we continue to look at it. It's our, it's our foundation. It's our rock. It's what the Lord has given us to live by, right? Truth to live by in the Word of God. I'm guessing that if I held up a 1909 uh, baseball card of Hannes Wagner and said, I'd like to give you this as a gift. Most of you would probably take one look at that card, and the first thing you probably would say is, Hannes who, uh, perhaps. And the second thing is, doesn't look like much. Kind of a colorized old thing. And you want to give me that as a gift? But you would probably be well advised to listen to the next piece of this. The last time that baseball card sold at auction, it went for $2.3 million. Now, do you want it? I'm, I'm guessing your mind might have changed, right? Why is it so valuable? Well, it's valuable, number one, because it is Hannes Wagner, one of the first five men inducted into the Hall of Fame, Baseball Hall of Fame, along with Walter Johnson, Christy Mathewson, Babe Ruth, and Ty Cobb, right? It's, it, it's important because Hannes Wagner is still conceded in the minds of many people to be the greatest shortstop of all time. He's a famous guy. But it's mostly the perception of the receiver that makes it important, right? It turns out that Hannes Wagner had, there were 40 of those printed. He stopped them because they were being issued. It was the first baseball cards issued. They were being issued by a tobacco company. He didn't smoke, and he didn't want to encourage anybody else to smoke. So when he found out... They were issuing his image on a baseball card. He told them to cease and desist. So they only printed 40. To the best of what I can find, there are only 10 in existence today and only one that's kind of in pristine condition. 
that might go for $2.3 million. But the value is in the perception of the recipient, right? Have you ever wondered how your gifts to God look? I, I think we probably have a lot of misconceptions. I think for a lot of us, we think our gift to God is really important because, man, this is really costing me a lot. Others of us would think, why should I even bother to give? I mean, God has everything. He owns everything anyway. What's the big deal about giving? What I want us to see this morning, why this text is so important, is because it shows us how to add rare value to our gifts to God. You can give a gift that is really basically meaningless. Or you can give a gift that is absolutely priceless. Priceless giving. On the last day of his ministry, Jesus warns his disciples against the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees, Israel's leaders. That would have seemed strange, very strange. The scribes were not only legends in their own minds, they were legends in the minds of most of the people that were living in Palestine at that point in time. The basic idea that the people would have had is if the scribes aren't getting it right, who in the world can possibly get it right? And here's Jesus warning against them. How can we get it right? Where is there any hope for us to do it if these guys can't? And this little vignette is given, beloved, to show us that there is plenty of hope for all of us to get it right. Plenty of hope. Jesus sits to rest in the middle of this engagement that he's been having with his enemies and then just preaching and sharing the gospel during these last hours of his life. He sits to rest, according to Matthew, Mark's gospel, chapter 12. And as he does, he sees this little event happen that shows the true love of God on the part of a poor, helpless widow, contrasted with the piety of those who robbed widows in order to feather their own nest. Quite a contrast. The value of the widow's gift compared to that of the Pharisees is what's on tap here. And the woman wins hands down. That's amazing. They're giving great gifts. She's giving such a small one. And yet in verse 3, Jesus commends her gift. And in verse 4, Jesus tells us why the woman's gift is priceless. The people are standing around, they're ooing and aahing over the great gifts of those Pharisees and those scribes that they are giving. Jesus extols the gift of this woman. The Pharisees and the scribes are finding a claim on the part of people. The woman is finding a claim on the part of God, which is far more important. So we have to ask ourselves, well, why? What made her gift so much greater? Why in Jesus' eyes was this little bit that she could give so wonderful? Because if she can make a priceless gift, so can we. So can we. So let's take a look at what it took to make a priceless gift. Three points, actually. A three-point sermon, believe it or not. I know they're rare, so enjoy it, okay, when well, you can. Number one, God values gifts by the spirit in which they are given. God values gifts by the spirit in which they are given. I, you know, the first question that comes to mind is giving to God, to the Lord's work. How is it to you? Is it a privilege or is it a duty? Is it a privilege or is it a duty? Is it done enthusiastically or is it done grudgingly? Because, beloved, that makes all the difference. Priceless gifts are given with enthusiasm. You give grudgingly and honestly. You might as well keep it. 
That's not the right solution, but you might as well for all the value that it represents to the Lord. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. We've already read from there this morning, but we'll look at it in a little more detail. You need to hold your place. We're going to look at a number of passages today and might have trouble keeping up, but kind of hold 2 Corinthians 8 as well. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, there's an amazing thing that happens. Um, Paul is talking about giving. He's encouraging the Corinthians with the need to give. But what's amazing in this passage is that seven times in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, he uses the word grace. He uses the word grace to speak of God's gift to us, which we recognize and understand. But he also uses the word grace to speak of our giving to God. If you can imagine that. Our gift can be a grace to God if it's done in the right way. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in love, in our love for you, See that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. What Paul is saying is, giving is a test of our love for God. You say you love God, God is saying, let me see the money. He's not saying because he needs money, beloved. He's saying it because he wants to know that you love him. And he wants to pour out your, his blessing upon you. But he realizes one test of our love and the great test of our love for him is whether we're willing to give or not, whether we're willing to follow his commands. He's told us, if you love me, keep my commands. Here's one of my commands. You know, a special someone comes into your life right? If you can remember back that far for some of us, right? <laughs> they come into your life. And what's the first reaction you have? Automatically, you want to give gifts, right? You can't wait to give a gift. It doesn't matter if it took the whole week's salary. You want to pour out a gift upon that person. But now imagine that you've bought that locket, you know, and you've given it to her, and it's beautiful, and it costs you all this money, and she says, oh, Bill, it's so beautiful. It's, it, it must have been so expensive. You shouldn't have. Why did you do that? And you say, well, honey, it was, a, it was my duty. I had to. And besides that, it was on sale, right? You might as well have saved your money, right? You might as well not give it. What gives the gift value? The spirit in which it's given, right? It is the spirit that gives value to a gift. In our passage back in Luke, two ways that God gives us to have the right spirit in giving. Number one, humility toward others. Humility toward others. It's not a contest, beloved. And it's not giving to see how many times we can get our name on a plaque or something else. Humility toward others. Jesus is resting here in the women's court. The women's court is the court in the temple where only Jews could come. Jews, men, and women. Then there was the men's court where only Jewish men could go, and then there was the priest's court. Before that was the Gentile court. Jesus is in the women's court where both Jews, men, and women could be watching the people give. This court was equipped with 13 kind of trumpet-shaped um, collection boxes that were mounted to the wall. They were small at top, large at the bottom, and so you put in your money as you came. Jesus is watching as people come to give. Significantly, listen, significantly, he sees the big ones, but he also sees the small ones. Jesus sees them all. God knows them all. God values those, especially that are given 
in the right spirit. Now, we know that there were many rich people giving here. Mark 12 tells us many rich people put in large sums. We should not totally condemn them. Undoubtedly, some of those were giving with the right spirit, right? But most of them weren't. How do we know that? Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verse 2, Jesus said this, Thus, when you, you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that he knew full well that most of the rich people who were coming and giving large sums of money were timing it for maximum exposure. They wanted people to see what they were giving, and they wanted people to acclaim them because of what they were giving. Their whole purpose was to draw attention to themselves. He tells us in Matthew 23, some of them were even robbing money that should go to their parents and saying, Corban, which means sorry for you, I'm giving it to God. Why? Because they wanted a claim from other people. It meant more to them than taking care of their parents. Wow. And Jesus knew that. So what's his opinion? His opinion is this. Enjoy the attention that you're getting now because that is all the reward you're ever going to get. There's nothing of eternal value or worth about just giving so people will pat you on the back. So does that mean that rich people can never give a priceless gift? Of course not. Rich people can give a priceless gift just like poor people can give a priceless gift or people in the middle can give a priceless gift. It's all dependent on the spirit in which it is given. The widow gave two coins, two little copper coins. They were worth about one 128th of a day's salary in that day. Four minutes worth of work. That's all she had to give. But she gave what she had, and because she gave with humility, that gift was multiplied to be something that was of eternal value. Amazing, isn't it? It all had to do with the spirit in which you were given. It was an eternal investment. Jesus tells us this. Back again in Matthew 6, verse 3, he says, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your gift, giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So those who are giving to be, be seen, the only reward is what you're going to get now. You give in secret and the Father will reward you later in heaven. Well, that's different, isn't it? Which reward do you want? Which is important to you? Where is it going to matter a hundred years from today? So anybody can give a priceless gift, big or little, it depends on the humility with which it is given, and it depends on the spirit in which it is given. This woman's gift was given in humility. She wasn't giving to be seen by, by people. They would have laughed at her. She was giving in a spirit of humility. You know, a few years ago, the seminary I went to had a fundraising exercise for a new building they were building. And part of their campaign was they allowed you to send in a, the name of a professor that was particularly meaningful you, and you could give money in his name and they were going to put his name on a wall. And so I gave some money and I, in my heart I can tell you I, I believe I was doing it to honor Bob Sosi. But not long ago, I think it was after we came here, we were at a family reunion. One of our nieces who had now, was now going to school at Biola where I graduated from came up and said, hey, I saw your name on the wall. I'm trying to think, why would my name be on the wall, right? And then I realized they didn't just put Bob Sosie's name on the wall, they put my name on the wall. I'll tell you, I made up my mind then and there, I will never give somewhere where my name's going on a brick or on a 
glass, piece of glass that's going in like the crystal cathedral or anywhere else. It's the wrong reason, beloved. If you want to give for that, and do, but enjoy the reward of people patting you on the back now because that's all you will ever get. We had a church we were in, Patty and I were in, was also in a building program. And one of the things they did was the pastor got up one day and, and claimed, hopefully this was true, claimed the elders had convinced him he needed to tell the congregation what percentage of, of his salary he was giving over the next three years to this building program as an incentive for them to give. And I thought, oh, man, that is ill-advised. I don't want to know. And I don't think they should have wanted anybody to know. Listen, beloved, I hope and pray that you will continue to give sacrificially to this building program that we're in as you have been doing for the last three years. I trust that you will do that. And I'd be a hypocrite if I asked you to do that if I wasn't doing the same thing, wouldn't I? But how much you give is not my business, and how much I give is not your business. Let's together do it for the Lord's sake, right? If, if God doesn't want my left hand to know what I'm giving, I'm pretty sure he doesn't want you to know what I'm giving, right? Right? This is one of the reasons people ask me, because I read books and they say, hey, the pastor ought to know what everybody's giving, you know, so that you can go twist arms or do whatever. I don't ever want to know that. There are two people in our church who know what you give because we have, somebody has to know, right? That's it. Give privately out of a love for the Father. not for a claim of men. Humility toward others. Secondly, the right attitude to give is with honor toward God. It's to honor God, not self, that we give. Verse 2 of our text, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, this widow has put in more than all of them. How, now, how, can you, how could that possibly be? She's put in these two little coins. They're useless. They're useless. Except that they honored God, not her, right? And that made them priceless. That made them priceless. Do you find it hard, like I do, to really examine your heart and say, am I, am I giving for the right reasons here? It's hard, isn't it? The only way I really know if I'm giving in a way that is priceless and is really toward the Lord is if it is costing me something. What is it that I'd like to do that I now won't be able to do? And be, uh, you know, I'll be honest, we live a, a very comfortable life. But there are times when we want to give, and we give by giving up something that we would like to do, that we could do, but now we can't do because we want to give. That's the way to give. That's what the Lord is getting at here. Second Corinthians, if you're still there, 9, verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves the cheerful giver. How much should you give? As much as you can with a cheerful heart. Jesus' commendation of this woman shows that she was giving her last penny cheerfully. So great was her love for God. Is your love that great? He says, I, God loves a cheerful giver. You, you've heard this, I'm sure, before. The, the, the word cheerful is the word hilarious. We get our word, word hilarious from it. God loves a hilarious giver. He doesn't mean that you are, you know, like watching the Three Stooges or something hilarious, but he means that you are cheerful, that you are welcoming this opportunity to give to his work. I was in E.V. Hill's church. Any of you remember E.V. Hill's, the old uh, black pastor that used to be on TV, wonderful man of God, one TV pastor I could recommend. There's a couple. E.V. Hill was great, and he was down in Watts, had a wonderful ministry down there. When President Nixon offered him a cabinet position, he said, no, I got, I got a, a more important job right here. Well, I was at his church one night speaking, and, they, and he took the offering. And when he got up to take the offering, he went through this passage, and he explained the word hilarious. And then in his own inimitable way, he said, you know, when that offering plate comes by, you ought to jump up and say, Hallelujah! 
So they started the music, right? And then they started the plate around, right? And sure enough, when they got to the back row, some guy put his money in and stood up and said, Hallelujah! And then they counted the money. <laughs> and apparently it wasn't enough because 10 minutes later he got back up again. He said, listen, folks, we need a few more hilarious givers. We didn't get enough, so we're passing it again. And that's exactly what they did. They do things a little differently, some of those places. But it was wonderful to be there. The Israelites experienced this. Randy Alcorn points out that there are three building programs in the Bible. Three. And he says every one of them was funded up front, fully paid for by money that came in prior to the building project. The first one was the tabernacle back in Exodus 35. Let's turn there and take a look. Moses let the need be known because God told him to. So he said, we're going to need this, and we're going to need that, and we're going to need material, and we're going to need gold, and we're going to need silver. And if you read about the tabernacle, there was a lot of all of that in the tabernacle. And God moved people's hearts to give. Exodus 35, verse 29, all the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering. Underline that because we'll come back to it. They brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. They brought it beyond their ties. They brought it with no arm twisting. So did they make it? Exodus 36, verses 6 and 7. So Moses gave command, and word was proclaimed throughout the camp, let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from building. I'm waiting for the day when we say, folks, no offering today. Don't need it. Moses got to do that. The people were restrained from building for the material they had was sufficient to do the work and more. Enough already. We're there. Isn't that good? Because God put it on their heart and they obeyed. That's priceless giving when you have to turn it off. Same thing happened when Solomon rebuilt the temple, that beautiful, unbelievable building that was seven years in the building in 1 Chronicles 29. Same thing when Ezra rebuilt the temple after the Babylonian captivity and the people came back 400 years later, 400 years after Solomon's temple, and they rebuilt the temple in Ezra 1, all of it with free will offerings. And beloved, God can do the same through us. Wouldn't it be great if one day we could say, you know, you put all the nickels together and all the dollars and all the hundreds of dollars and all the thousands of dollars that came from different people, depending on what they could give. You would put it all together and God build a new church through us. It would be a wonderful day when we can do that, won't it? It's up to us. Giving cheerfully, not just to build a building, but to honor God. Investing in eternity. God values gifts by the spirit in which they are given. Secondly, God values gifts by the sacrifice that they represent. God values gifts by the sacrifice that they represent. Jesus' statement in this regard is really profound. He says in verse 3b, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. More than all of them. Two coins. How can that be more than all of them who are giving so much. Clearly, the amount was not the issue, right? Couldn't have been the amount. So what was the issue? Verse 4. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. God counts our giving as a percentage of what we 
could give, right? That's how she could be said to have given the most. The greatest of all was coming from her. Abundance, they gave out of their abundance, which means more than enough left over. The implication is they wouldn't even miss it. She gave out of her poverty, her deficiency, her want. Said she, doesn't, she already didn't have enough to live on, and, and yet she gave everything. Now, the first question that arises is, well, so, okay, so God, does God expect us to give everything? And the answer is yes and no. Okay, yes and no. Yes, in this sense, that everything we have already belongs to him. Everything we have already belongs to him. If you don't look at it that way, you don't have the right perspective. If you think you've got ownership of anything, you got the wrong perspective. God says in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7, what do you have that you did not receive? From where? From God. It all came from God. Everything we have came from God. This is Jesus' message in the parable, you know, the servant parables, the parables of the talents and of the money. It's given away. What is it? It's that I've given this to you. Now I want to see what you're going to do with it. How are you going to manage this? What are you going to? It's mine, but how are you going to manage it for me? What will you do with it? And 1 Corinthians 4, 2 reminds us more of it is required of stewards that one be found. What? Faithful. Faithful. So the starting point in giving is to realize it's all God's anyway. We're just managing it for him but we will one day give account, right? We will one day give account. All of us will one day give account. So does that mean we have to put it all in the offering plate by the, like this widow did? And the answer is no. That's why there's a yes and no. It doesn't mean that. But let's look at what it does mean 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, if you're still in 2 Corinthians, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Must give as he has decided in his heart. So you have a responsibility to say, okay, God's given me this. Here's 100% of it. All belongs to him. But how much am I going to give directly to his work? You decide. That's your decision. You'll answer for it, but it's your decision. We have an example in Acts 5. Acts chapter 5. You remember how in the early days of the church, there were a lot of poor people in Jerusalem. A lot of the new believers had nothing. It was an economic downturn in addition to everything else. And then there were some people that had a lot, as usual. It was one of those economies that was, you know, the poor and the rich and very little in between. So the rich people, those who had, were selling property off because they loved their God and they loved their fellow person so much, they were selling property to give to those who were poor. And they were bringing it to the temple. So, one of these believers, a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira, followed suit. And you know the story, verse 1, Acts 5. A man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back. For himself, some of the proceeds, and brought only a part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, was it not, did it not remain your own? In other words, you didn't have to sell it if you didn't want to. And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? In other words, you could decide what you wanted to give and what you didn't want to give. It was yours to, to decide. Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. See, the problem wasn't that he didn't give it all. The problem was that he lied about it. That he said he was giving it all. Right? God didn't require that by his faithfulness he give everything that he had directly to the Lord's work, but he certainly didn't want him 
to lie about it. God always wants us to give something. I mean, that's really clear, but the rest is to be used by us wisely, I think not extravagantly. Let me give you a clue. There's a baseline. I mean, I know people look at that passage in 2 Corinthians 9 and say, ah, we're New Testament, we're under grace, we can give whatever we want, doesn't matter. Doesn't have to be 10%. We're not tied to that anymore. And we're not, legally. But listen, the Bible is very clear about, about the bottom end, the, kind of the minimal giving. It's 10%. We're just kidding ourselves if we don't think that. The tithe in the Old Testament, when Abraham came back, gave to Melchizedek after taking spoil when, he, when Lot got in trouble, remember, and Abraham went and saved him and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to give him goods, and he said, no, I can't take that. You'll say, you made Abraham rich. He wouldn't take anything. And then instead of taking something, he gave 10% to Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem who came down, 10%. In Genesis 28, 22, when Jacob finally got right with God, before he had anything in his pocket, he said, Lord, all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. When God delivered the law to Moses, he required a 10% tithe off the top. If you read carefully, you'll find that he required another 13%, 10% per year and 10% every third year to basically cover what we would call today government-related issues, a tax. It was a, it was a, it was a nation state in those days. Free will giving was over and above all of that. People were allowed to and expected to provide for self and for families, but giving to God's work has always been and will always be part of stewardship. Part of who we are as a Christian, part of what God will put it in our heart to want to do. And I think, you know, from our text in Luke, the thing we have to notice is that... Uh, Poverty is no, ex no excuse for not giving, right? I don't think I can say that I've ever been in poverty. Pretty sure I can't. I can say my folks were pretty close. And yet I saw them faithfully give 10% right off the top every week. Never missed a beat. Poverty is no excuse. And it's not just this woman. You, you know, did you catch what we read this morning in 2 Corinthians 8? Listen to what Paul says to the Corinthians. Because he's giving them the example. He's in the Corinthians the example of what happened in Philippi with the Philippians. He says in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 2, for in a severe test, giving is always a test, by the way, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Can, how can you miss what he's saying here? you got a heart for God. You're going to have a heart for giving. You're going to have a heart for God's people. You're going to have a heart for people who don't know God and want them to be able to come to know God. You're going to have a heart for the poor. You're going to have a heart to give. What an example. Few of us can claim poverty, I think, but if we could, poverty is no excuse for not giving. And if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5, you'll see why. But they gave themselves first to the Lord. And then by the will of God, they gave themselves to us, is what he's saying. They gave money to us because they had first given themselves. Have you given yourself to the Lord? Listen, beloved, the, one way you'll know that you belong to God is he'll touch your pocketbook. I still remember, it's an old story, late in life, the, uh, the uh, scoundrel Sam Houston, you know, who basically founded the country and later the state of Texas became the governor, he was just a hard-bitten guy, but he got saved late in life. And the church where he came to know Christ, he said, I'd like to pay 
half of the pastor's salary from now on. They said, half the salary? You want to pay? He said, yeah. He said, when I, when I got baptized, God baptized my wallet too. And God does that. He puts it in our heart to give because he gave so much for us. You caught Jesse's point there, that the Lord has given everything. How can we not want to give? It just comes natural to a Christian, to a believer. You know, I, I think most of us think we're too poor because we do, because we give backwards. We give backwards. Say, so what do you mean? In a little book called God and Your Stuff, Wesley Wilmer tells this story about a guy named Dave Adrian. He said, Dave graduated from George Fox University in Oregon. He started working, Christian guy. Just starting working, he just barely has enough to make ends meet, right? His giving was sporadic at best. And then he found Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. The first fruits of all your produce. Honor the Lord with the first fruits of all your produce. What does that mean? It means the first check of the week, the month, however often you get paid. It means the first check goes to God. See, we, we write out the bills, we write out the utilities, we write out the house payment, we write out the car payment. Write, oh, nothing left over this month. Too bad, God. Tough. It's backwards. Here's what Dave Adrian did. Wilmer says Dave did, started to give to God first, 10%. Started to give to God first for three months. And to his amazement, he found that he never depleted his checking account. He couldn't figure it out except to conclude that this was God's economics. Dave realized that God was meeting his needs as he gave first to God. God values gifts, beloved, by the sacrifice they represent and by the order in which we give them. Remember David? God told him, I want, you to, I want you to build an altar on the threshing floor of this guy named Aruna. And so David came to Aruna and he said, hey, God told me to build an altar on your property. And Aruna said, oh, man, that's... What a privilege. Let me give you the land so you can do that. It's the same place, by the way, that where the temple was eventually built, before the temple was built. And David said, no, 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 no. no. I can't take that from you. Here's what he said in 2 Samuel 24, verse 24. But the king said to Aruna, no, I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord that cost me nothing. David knew that God values gifts by the sacrifice they represent. Listen, let me help you with this. Because, you know, we got, we, got peop, we got, you're all over the spectrum here. Some of you are rich, some of you are poor, some of you are in between. How do you decide? Here's what C.S. Lewis said. This is his gut check. It's a wonderful one. He says, if our expenditure on comforts, comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. Did you get that? If our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as us, we are probably giving away too. He's not saying we should all live at the same level of comfort, same level of ease. They didn't in the Bible, but he's saying if your level of ease is the same as everybody else who has the same kind of income you do, you're probably giving away too little. He goes on, he says, if our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say that they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable ex expenditure excludes them. That's a great principle. I refer it to you to examine, as you examine your own heart before God. What are we giving? What should, be, what should we be giving? How do we do this? But know this, God values sacrifice. God values giving by the sacrifice 
It represents priceless giving costs something. Priceless giving costs something. Finally, quickly, God values gifts by blessing the giver. God values gifts by blessing the giver. You say, where do you see that in this passage? Well, we don't know what happened to this widow. I grant you that. But what we do know is that God gave her a privileged position in his word. It doesn't get any better than that, does it, until you get to heaven. God gave her a privileged position in his word. And you can bet that her reward in heaven, if not on earth, was staggering. 2 Corinthians 9.8, if you're still there, has the principle. 2 Corinthians 9.8, just, just so we don't miss it, Paul makes it very specific. He says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now listen, I realize our health and wealth Gospel guys tell us, you know, we got to have seed faith and we got to do this and then we're going to get the Cadillac. And the, that is not what this passage is teaching. Not what it's teaching. But what it's saying is you cannot outgive God. The reward may come here or it may come in the life to come, but it will come. You cannot outgive God. Not if it comes from a heart of love. John Bunyan says this, there was a man, some called him mad. The more he gave, the more he had. I don't know about the more he had, but the more you will have in glory. This is the way we invest in eternity. What makes a gift priceless when it's given with a spirit of humility, a spirit of enthusiasm, a spirit of thankfulness, a spirit of privilege to give, a spirit of sacrifice. That's something we can all do. You don't have to be rich to do this. I love this story I came across somewhere in the early days of their, minister, of their marriage before they got famous. Billy and Ruth Graham, imagine this. They went to some little church someplace. They're not famous yet. Nobody knows who they're going to be. They go to this little church where he's going to preach, and he is getting ready to preach, and they pass the offering plate along, and Billy digs in his pocket. He thinks he's throwing in a $1 bill, and just as the plate's going on where he can't possibly retrieve it, he sees it was a $10 bill. $10 bill, and, and at that point in time, it represented a lot of money to them. His heart kind of sank. And then furthermore, when he got done preaching, they didn't even give him an honorarium that day. So he's on his way home, and he's telling his wife how bad he felt. You know, he's looking for sympathy. Pastors who look for sympathy from their wives, you know. Now, my wife is very gracious. I get more support from her than I ever could possibly deserve. But he was looking, but, but, but there are times like this as well, when her wisdom is greater than mine. And Ruth, Ruth said to him when he was looking for sympathy after he told his story, she said, yeah, and just think, the Lord's only going to give you credit for one dollar because that's all you meant to give. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? It's true. That's what this is teaching. You can either have the acclaim now, or, beloved, you can be laying up treasure in heaven. I want to get full credit, don't you? I want to get full credit. How do we get that? By giving generously, enthusiastically, selfish, sacrific sacrificially to a loving, heavenly Father who will outgive us every time. The only thing we're going to wish in heaven is that we'd given more. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this challenge from your word once again. Bring it home to us, Father, and... and 
Lord, help us not to examine our hearts and say, well, it looks like I can't give because I can't give with the right attitude. Instead, help us to change the attitude so that we can have full credit. And Lord, help our motivation to be exactly what you gave to Paul. If you gave everything for us, how could we give less for you? Challenge us. Use us for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.